So people are like, oh, you got a re- religious worldview. It's like, what worldview do you have? Yeah. And that worldview might be being shaped by your feelings, mm-hmm. right? Totally. It might be yeah. being shaped by your by your bitterness. Mm-hmm. It might be shaped by your experience, your life yeah. experience. You're like terrorists have a worldview. Everybody, yeah. everybody has a world. Even everybody's formed. And yeah. I, t- <clears throat> I say this to people often: if you're not intentionally being discipled mm-hmm. by Jesus, you are unintentionally being discipled by the culture. Chris Bellton here. Welcome to the Cultural Catalyst, where we help you to learn how to live fully live, co-labor with God, and change the world. And today I have Chris Cruz. Hello. Chris Cruz. Glad to be here. That is your, Christopher, yeah. that is yeah. your name. Christopher, yeah. Christopher Cruz, right? Only heard it when Cruz. my mom was. <laughs> yeah. Your mom was yeah. Mad. When my mom was mad. Christopher Joseph Cruz. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. My mom would call me Christopher John, but mm-hmm. my name's not Christopher and my middle name's not John. <laughs> and I don't know That's why awesome. she didn't just name That's me awesome. Christopher John. She likes it so say. much. You know what I'm saying? That's awesome. But <laughs> sorry. Christopher, yeah. you are uh you're one of our you're our associate pastor. In yep. fact, you're mm-hmm. kind of our senior associate Let's pastor mm-hmm. now and over the church and you're <laughs> working you with you oversee Dan. tribe. Yeah, our young adults. Yeah. I, don't, mm-hmm. I wouldn't call that working when you're worth the end. But anyway, <laughs> I'm glad you describe it like that. Yeah, and you, that's awesome. You, you this is going to be a good podcast. Yeah, I can tell already. It's going to be a good podcast. <laughs> you, uh, you graduated from BSSM, so yeah. you came here for BSSM, right? Yeah. How many years ago was that? It's almost 15 years. It came in 2007. Wow. Yeah, a long time. Did so you, I've, been, I've been listening to you talk for a long time. <laughs> Long time. That's yeah. why you were asleep in the, yeah. on the couch. I mean, I didn't, yeah, exactly. I was asleep on the couch before this because I'm ready to practicing dreams and visions. Exactly, like I taught you in school. Yeah. 100%. And then you, uh, now. You're the one that taught me how to hear God. <laughs> yeah, that's like, exactly right. I mean, I heard him before, but I didn't know how to hear him after that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> that's it. Came to school and learned it from you. And you are married. Yeah. Did you find your woman in school? Yeah, first year. Yeah, you're well, Thank I, you. I haven't seen any tithe checks lately. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully your marriage is going well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I met my wife in first year. She, she's Canadian. This is back back in the day. Yeah, yeah. And you have two kids. Yeah. Solomon, who's five, about to turn six, and my daughter Pearl, who's three. Man, yeah. that, that's a full that's a full house right mm-hmm. there. That's it's fun. A lot, a lot of energy. Challenge. Chris, you know, you um I, I when I think of you, I think of a lot of different things as far as the Lord goes, but mm-hmm. you have a real strong passion, especially for discipleship. Yeah. It's kind of mm-hmm. kind of ooze through most of your messages. Yeah. And I would mm-hmm. imagine that that's because it's really had a big impact on you. Yeah. So let's mm-hmm. talk about, first of all, discipleship, mm-hmm. what the kind of impact it's had on you. Yeah. And then, and then uh, a little bit about how do we, what does that look like? Yeah. And how do we, and how do we get discipled ourselves? And mm-hmm. let's just talk about that. Let's, yeah. let, let's let that be the center of our subject. Today. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, like you said, it, the impact on my life, the inner growth, the transformation that came. I had a, just before coming to school of ministry, a couple of years before that, I had a radical encounter with the Holy Spirit. And then from that, I longed to experience what that moment was like on a consistent basis of like, wow, that was incredible. How do I keep that going in my and life? Not have an event-based yeah. relationship with Jesus. Exactly. Like, what am I doing after that? Now everything feels like it's all been turned around. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop so, out of college yeah. and go figure out going to a ministry school of some sort. Eventually, found Bethel. But my longing was to, to actually figure out what does this actually look like to live this yeah. new life because I didn't have, I didn't have a church. I got, I got my parents would go to church on a Sunday. Sometimes we drive an hour to New York to go to church because there was nothing in our radius that close by that had anything that my mom and dad hungered for, which was revival. Yeah. And so they had this small home group thing that they would do. And that's where I encountered the Holy Spirit when in, they brought me down. In your house. Yeah, like Got six it. people. And so they prophesied over me. I wasn't interested in any of it. Like I was I was upstairs trying to figure out life, not involved with Jesus at all. And I had this encounter. And then it sent me into this like complete change of life, now longing to live in that presence that was so completing. Like I tell people, the love that I experienced that moment felt like it 
kind of erased my insecurities and completed me. It was like the, the wow. entire missing thing of my life. Like what was driving much of my poor behavior was this deep lack of worth, lack of self identity yeah. and sense of love and completeness that came when the Holy spirit came on me. And I'm going, how do I live that way going forward? And so I started to explore. I only had heard somebody one time talk about your prayer closet. And they were like, so I literally thought it was a literal closet. Me too. I, I was in one for a <laughs> yes. year before someone told me it was a metaphor. <laughs> yes. There I was. I had a, a headlamp. closet. I had a my headlamp. Bible. Exactly. <laughs> I had my Bible or a headlamp. I seriously, I didn't have yep. a headlamp, but I did the same thing. Pillow in there, and I would go in there and read and pray. So that's all I would do. You totally ruined it when yeah. someone told me what that was a metaphor. <laughs> that's a metaphor. Yeah, I didn't later on. It came. It wasn't with, for me. Yeah, it wasn't for me. It was literally in a closet with a headlamp on, praying, and then God's presence. And one would be day there. you came out of the closet. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> in a very great way, um, and I would, I literally would come out of my actually open up my closet door and the the sense of God's presence was sometimes terrifying to the point where I had to put the lights on wow. because I felt so scared of what was this kind of otherworldly presence that was in my room. You mean like the fear of the Lord? Came. Yeah, the fear of the Lord. Not, and I not, didn't have like a bad fear. Not a bad fear. It was a, like an awe. It was like a home. Whoa, it shook me. Yeah. And so, so good. And I, I started to just spend time. I tell, I tell people often it was I would be in my room locked away looking at porn to now being in my room locked away praying. But the 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 journey of from that moment on was Jesus was changing something from the inside. So I good. wasn't part of a church program. I wasn't part of a um, any kind of group from that moment on. It was me and Jesus. And I was, not that that's the pinnacle or the way that we want everybody to live or even how ideally it should be, yeah. but it's all I had. My, so I walked this journey the yeah, and he's, and he was changing me from the inside out. I'd read scripture and I'd read things that were like, whoa. So my first journey of being a disciple of Jesus was truly being with him. And then as I started to read the scriptures, you see Jesus's invitation isn't to a program, but to being with him. What do you say to people that they say, man, I read my Bible and mm -hmm. I just can't. Well, I don't understand it. Yeah. You know, I don't get it. It's really boring. It's mm -hmm. it's not in a not usually not in story form. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so you know, I'm trying to do what you're telling yeah. me to do, but, but yeah, I, I, it's not having the same effect on me. Yeah, I'm not feeling the glory of God, and I'm not even understanding my Bible. Yeah, but how would where would you suggest someone like? Well, there's a lot of people mm -hmm. watching this that maybe are new believers. Yeah. Or maybe they just never really had a relationship with mm -hmm. the Bible because yeah. you're incorporating a lot Bible yeah. in your mm -hmm. in my in time your, with the Lord. Yeah, it's how He's decided Lord. to reveal Himself to us yeah. is through Scripture, amongst many things. But He'll never. I tell people this often, especially learning from you how to yeah. hear God, and you're you're. I mean, your manual prophetic ministry. Yeah, everything's rooted in Scripture, yeah. so you hear the idea that God doesn't will never reveal Himself to you that it isn't an echo of what he's already said in scripture. So good. And so you're seeing a revealing God. The first part of your heart is to say, God desires, not not only do I desire to experience him, yeah. he desires to reveal himself. Do you ever like open your Bible and read it and it's like totally dry? Yes, like 100%. Dry, yeah. 100%. And, and so the secret there is yeah. what? So I, I have, I tell people, I've learned this in different ways, but the, the, the thing we need to think about is reading the Bible in maybe three different ways. Okay. So most people go to it one way, Russian roulette style. They just open it up and they go, where is it? And hopefully you don't pick the Judas part where he hung himself. And you're like, okay, not a good spot to start. Judas hung himself. Yeah. And go do likewise. Yeah. The next yeah. And they just open it and read and they kind yeah. of don't have a sense of what okay. they're going for. So I say you have study. Study the question is what does the text mean? That's not every time I'm going into the Bible. I'm not going into the Bible every time going, what does this text actually mean to the original audience? So, That's that. So you're reading that and you're you're asking yourself questions. Oh, In other words, yeah. instead of just reading the text, you're mm -hmm. saying, okay, wh when, when, let's say Jesus, if yeah. Jesus is the yeah. one talking, who was he talking to? Yeah, I'm getting the context of the story. I mean, there's yeah. that question, study. Then there's devotional and then there's meditation. So devotional is what does this mean to me? I start to engage with it like, what is this oh, saying so to me? Good. And so I have this study. What does it actually say? Yeah. Oh, what is it saying to me? Got and it. then you're going, meditation is, how do I get it in me? So you start to engage with it in a meditative way, which, for example, you can read a psalm in that space. So if you're thinking, how do I read the Bible when I spend time with God? You've got these three great options of engaging with God in it. the scripture. Study, if you're actually trying to do that. 
Then you have devotional, which are, you're pulling it for, what does this mean to me? And then meditation, how do I get it in me? So meditation looks like, for me, there's ancient practices like Lexio Divina, which is just sacred whoa, whoa, reading. Whoa, whoa, bro. Yeah, Slow I know. Slow down. Lexio Divina. Yeah, Lexigo. Lexigo. Divina. Lego Divino. Um, no, it's not Legos. a pizza place. Legos. It's it's a what it's a way of reading. Mean? Where, sacred reading. That word? Sacred reading. It's I believe it's Latin. Okay. Lexio Divina. It's sacred reading, and it's a practice where we all do it. We just don't have a label like that. The, oh, I got the Lego yeah, part. No, yeah. <laughs> so it's read it, pray it, me, like um. It's read it, pray it, read it again, meditate on it. Like it's, there's these four or five steps you can take, but everybody's different. So what I do is, for example, if I go in um, that uh, I read, um, so I'm going, Jesus, come to me all who are uh, weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Okay. So I'll take that Matthew passage okay. and I'll read it going, come to me. And I'll just sit there with that for a second. And I'll say, Jesus, you invited me here today. Got it. You asked me to come to you. This is about you getting in. in yeah, you. this is the meditation part. I'm going, okay. you said, come to me. And it says, you're my shepherd. I am not. And I'll go through the Psalms and read, the Lord is my shepherd. And I'll go, and I'll pray and say, the Lord is my shepherd. And then I'll stop and I go, that means I am not. You are guiding me. You are leading me. I am following. And so I'm getting the scripture in me there. Got it. Devotional is a little bit more question of what does that mean? So God's a shepherd. So he's shepherding me. He's yeah. caring for me. It's I'm engaging with it differently. Yeah. But meditation is more about what does the word meditation actually mean? Um, so for me, when I look at the scriptures, they teach on meditation. Like when it says meditate on his works, these things, mm -hmm. it's calling to mind. It's an awareness. You're actually mm -hmm. filling yourself in this moment. You're, you're not trying to remove things. But that being said, there are moments where God is trying to settle you. And the settling is you're actually trying to shut off the chatter. Mm -hmm. And so sitting in God's presence, meditation is actually sometimes shutting off the chatter so that uh, one spiritual teacher says this, it's like grabbing, meditation begins like grabbing a jar of river water that's unclear. And then when you set it down, the sediment drops to the bottom and the water becomes clear. Most people are looking at their life so reckless, so restless that it's like a jar of river water and they're waiting. They're trying to figure out how to settle when God's going, if you sit in my presence and you settle, the sediment will drop and clarity will come to you. And so that's sometimes shutting off the chatter. Wow. And, and, and I do that with scripture and I do that with saying to him simply, I'm here. I'm here to be with you. Fill me. Like he's the, he is the, the one I'm, he's not my imaginary friend. It's like, <laughs> he's, he's, li imaginary he's friend. literally there. <laughs> he's like, he's right there. You, how often do you read your Bible? Like, how, um, do you, you know, is it a, something you do daily? Uh, the, I, the way that I tell people is there's not a day that goes by that I'm not engaging with Scripture, whether it's mentally I'm engaging with it, that I have a verse that I'm c contemplating, mm -hmm. that I'm thinking about, whether I've actually opened my Bible that day. Some days, no, I've got small kids, so there's an element of that. They're like, no, the day was rushed, and I fell asleep, and there's, that's not happening. Mm -hmm. But I have in my schedule built in times for me to spend chunks of reading with God, praying, those pieces. So those larger sections of intentional time happen three to four times a week, but they don't happen the same every time. And so I hesitate to, I hesitate to tell people exactly how I do it because most people are looking for like a, how do I plug and play your journey into my journey? Yeah. When I'm going, find out with Jesus, what does it look like? There's a great book about... Um, it's called Domestic Monastery, and it's about the home, the power of the home. And it, one of the things it does— Where do you get these titles, dude? <laughs> and they're beautiful. <laughs> they're beautiful. And so these, these they're from a whole My contemporary— books are like simple, like spirit wars. <laughs> I have to think of like something, uh, you don't have to think about what's inside my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. Sometimes that's better. This is simple. <laughs> yeah. So the, the concept of a domestic monastery is the idea that monks go away to learn what it is to be selfless, learn what it is to um, uh, have prayer as a focus of their life and be, they would say they're going away from the world for the sake of the world so that they can learn how to become love. That's how monks kind of view departing from society and going to monasteries. Well, this person realized that the, the, the way that mothers care and fathers care for their kids in the home, the same level of learning of selflessness, love, they found that mothers and fathers actually 
are experiencing that level of inner transformation without going to a monastery by simply loving their kids. Wow. So most people are trying to figure out how do I plug and play this when I'm going, no, the whole journey is all about it. Whether you're with your kids, Jesus says to the least of these you've done unto me. So what you would credit to God is yeah. something he may not credit, but what he credits to God is something you may not credit to him. My, my stepfathers didn't know anything about that <laughs> monastery, <laughs> domestic monastery ism, <laughs> or that other word that you that you quoted yeah, earlier. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, how to spell it. <laughs> in the yeah. show notes, how to spell it. How does your relationship with the scripture and the Lord affect your worldview? Mm-hmm. Like you see all this stuff going on yeah. right now. I mean, you know, we're... we're when you're watching this, uh, you may be watching it five years from now, but mm-hmm. we're just exiting COVID right now. Yeah. Social justice yeah. issues are, uh, you know, on mm-hmm. the rise. We're in the midst of uh, watching our, our Russian and Ukrainian yeah. brothers at war. How, how, do, mm-hmm. how does it, the scripture just help you on an everyday basis yeah. to navigate the craziness of life? Yeah. Um, I tend to use this phrase that Jesus offers usually a third way. And I see him regularly engaging with these high tension moments. And you see him answer questions or ask questions of situations that I wouldn't ask questions in or <laughs> situations I wouldn't like say. Not the Democrat way, not yeah, the Republican exactly. way, not the Russian way, not the Ukrainian way, He's but there's looking, this other third there's way. There's a third way that he engages with the world. And there's, I can give you titles of other fancy books, <laughs> but there's this third way of you engaging. you got my mind. Yeah, the third way of engaging with things that I would call this kingdom perspective, that Jesus is trying to get you to go, what does it look like where God reigns? And where God reigns, what does that look like in society and life and culture? And so Jesus had the kingdom. He was saying, repent, for the kingdom is at hand, a.k.a. change the way you think God's reign is available right now. So in all of these scenarios in in the world, I'm actually going, all right, Jesus started to reveal to us this kingdom perspective. How does Jesus, the Bible doesn't a and a on all cultural issues. No. But it does give you this vantage point of how do I engage with God on some of these issues and ask him questions based off of what scripture does reveal about him. And so there are some things regarding even like homosexuality. There's not a question in the Bible about like whether that's right or wrong. The Bible is clear on it being wrong, but how you engage with that. The Bible instructs you in the way of love. The Bible instructs you in the way of truth. And the Bible instructs you in the way of repentance. So you're hearing a framework in Scripture at times when Paul deals with um, the questions of slavery, when Paul deals with the questions of wives submitting to their husbands and husbands submitting to their wives. He deals. Why don't we just talk about that submission, the wives submitting? (laughs) You got a question about your home home life? life Catching. Well, and Chris says about yeah, your so submission. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you wrote the book, <laughs> Fashion to Rings. Yeah, I did. <laughs> no, this is good, though. Yeah, so I kind of look at the scripture to provide me. If Jesus, uh, I would say this. If Jesus, um, as John puts him, as the logos, the word becoming flesh. Yeah. The logos is this, the, the concept there is, in Greek, there is a, a way of looking at it, the order of the universe, the unifying principle of the universe, how the universe is created. Like the origin. Yeah, so going Jesus is this um, unifying reality. He has the take on reality, not me. Yeah. So he defines reality. He's the reality definer, Yeah. not me. So I have to actually submit to him to have my worldview shaped. So it's, scripture is doing that for me. It's interesting now, you know, because if you don't have scripture shaping your your worldview, mm-hmm. there are things that are shaping your worldview, right? Absolutely. So, so people are like, oh, you got a re- religious worldview. It's like, what worldview do you have? Yeah. And that worldview might be being shaped by your feelings, mm-hmm. right? Totally. It might be yeah. being shaped by your by your bitterness. Mm-hmm. It might be shaped by your experience, your life yeah. experience. You're like terrorists have a worldview. Everybody, yeah. everybody has a world. Even everybody's formed. And yeah. I, t- <clears throat> I say this to people often: if you're not intentionally being mm-hmm. discipled by Jesus. You are unintentionally being discipled by the culture. Yeah, somebody you have to make somebody somebody's somebody's doing discipling it. you. Yeah, somebody's doing it. There's a part of the brain, I think it's called a thalamus. It's the mm. filter of your brain. 
And you, at an early age, that thalamus begins to develop, and that thalamus is, it determines what you view as reality. Oh wow! And what you view, you know, what what you view is true, mm. and what you view is false. Wow! Like you watch a movie, like you watch, like I love like movies like The Gladiator, yeah. old movie. Yeah. But when I watch that, you know, I don't have any anxiety. Like, oh my gosh, this is the, this is real. But yeah. I, when I watch the, you know, the uh, when I watch documentaries what's happening with russia and ukraine yep. right now mm-hmm. i mean i'm i feel like that's mm. my brain my my brain knows that's entertainment this yeah. is reality mm-hmm. right so our we're actually training mm. our filter yeah our brain filter yeah in what to to what to pay attention to mm-hmm. what's real yeah and how to respond to it right yep absolutely you're uh let's 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 talk about bible related to Raising a family, mm-hmm. yeah, because raising a family is exciting. Mm-hmm. Some days tough, yeah. Some days My discouraging, right? Yes, absolutely. And then, and it doesn't end when your kids leave. By the way, which yeah, you haven't had you. that experience. Thank yet. Thank you for that. I know. <laughs> and uh, my 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 uh, my grandson's wife, which is my. I don't know. I, I can never figure out what your title is. She, she, she's, so, uh, she's, she's married to somebody related to you. Yeah, she is. She's my <laughs> grand. Anyway, whatever she is, she's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That she works for me. She's she's here right now. Yeah. So let's be careful. I okay. I, mean, I won't say anything too much. But no, on a serious note, like yep. how uh, how does your relationship with the Lord mm-hmm. and, and your relationship with the Word of God, yep. how does it help you to actually, yeah. you know, lead your family? and Yeah. Have yeah. a relationship with Atlanta and all, all of that. Uh, yeah, it's so real because I'm I'm thinking my responsibility primarily is shaping my son. Like even this weekend, I have a whole thing set up for him because he's going from five to six. And I have this moment where I'm going, hey, Lana, my, this is my wife. Here's what I'm going to do. I wept today sitting at the coffee shop talking to Lana about Solomon and my son is growing up, going from five to six. I have this unction from the Lord to do some stuff with him, to talk to him about sex, to talk to him about some things and go, hey, me and him are going to get away. At five years old, we're going to talk about some of these things and shape him and his worldview and how he sees the world. So I'm going, this is my responsibility. It's nobody else's. It's mine. I'm not going, this is what he's going to get at church. This is when he get at Sunday school. I'm like, no, this is me. This, this is, is what, beautiful. This is what I'm supposed to do. So, and then there's, so there's that part of me, the responsibility to shape my, ch- my, my son in the way of Jesus. I'm not hoping he finds his way through it. I'm actually saying, son, this is the way to I live I don't want to push my children you, towards, no. you know, I don't want to make them go to church. You yeah. know, like, I'm like, no, I'm, I, I'm responsible to shape you in the way of Jesus. That's the weirdest, weirdest. Well, I think some of that control stuff is, I, I think some of the people's responses, yeah. you know, we're talking about worldview, yeah. right? A little while ago, and how, how's your worldview yeah. shaped? And I think there's a lot of people that were raised in a in a Christian home, totally. That and a probably well-meaning parents yeah. that didn't know how to actually shepherd. Yeah, their it was family. more rule-based. They ended up feeling like they were not in a relationship, but all these hardcore rules: do, yeah. don't, do, don't. Never got actually told reasons why. Yeah, and S- some of the famous uh, artists and singers right yeah. now, I noticed they're raising. You know, strong Christian homes, and they're, yeah. they, you know, they're like, oh, that's the wrong way to do it, right? Yeah, totally. So what are some tips for people? You know, obviously, they want Jesus at the center of their yeah. kids' lives. At the same time, yeah. it, it can't be. It, yeah, it's, so a fun, a fun thing I've done with my kids, it comes in waves, right? Um, so I'm, I'm at the spot where I only can talk about the stuff that I have done, and I don't know the long-term fruit of all of it. I know what up to this point, yeah. what it's worked and looked like. <laughs> so the first five years looked like. It looked like this. So yeah. So there's the, um, so at one point I told my wife and I are constantly engaging with our kids about Jesus. Like, so when I'm walking around, who made the trees? And we'll talk through who made the trees. I, I found, I specifically read books uh, to them, um, kind of like creation story books yeah. that didn't jump right into Adam and Eve's sin, but actually jumped <laughs> first into God's goodness, creating the world. <laughs> so they had this worldview that God created a great world. They weren't immediately shaped by the idea of, oh my gosh, there's sin. It's, and humans screwed it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, wait, you can see that God makes good things. So they'll, totally. they know who made everything. Yeah. They go, God does. So then one day I told my wife, I want to figure out uh, how to engage the scriptures with them. And so I created this chart. Literally, it was on the side of my fridge. Uh-oh. It's come down now. You're scaring me. Yeah, I know. Look, it, it doesn't look Bro, like end times. you're scaring me. Not end times. It had stickers. <laughs> it, it wasn't end times. It wasn't end times. Sorry, sorry. It said worship, prayer, or Bible. And I 
I wrote, whatever you guys pick this morning, you could put a sticker on, and when you fill your box, you get some, I get a gift of some kind. But when, when I went to the Bible part, I didn't want to read a Bible story. I wanted to teach them what is the Bible. Uh-huh. So if you ask my kid right now, what is the Bible? He'll tell you this. It's an ancient story that tells you about who God is, who I am, and his plan to make the world beautiful. That's what he'll tell you the Bible is. Versus going, the, I know the Bible, I can tell you a Bible verse. He knows the purpose of the Bible. Wow. And so if I ask him, and my daughter, what is the Bible? She goes, it's an ancient library <laughs> of books that tell you the story of who I, God is, who I am, and how his plan to make the world wow. beautiful. So they can see. she's like three. three. And so that's how they view the Bible as this ancient library made up of all these books. And I go through, and so I have verses that I've paraphrased off of like message and things like yeah. that because my son's not going to write, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall understand it. My kids did. Yeah, yeah, not at five. So I, I worked with them in that way and then worship and that prayer. Was, that was painful, bro. I get it. My son last night prays at the dinner table and he says, we, we go, hey, we're, first off, my daughter goes, wait, we got to pray. So then my son, um, which is not something we were like, hey, we're praying. Like yeah. we're, we're yeah. working together with them to follow their flow. And so then my son prays and he goes, we pray for your wisdom, Jesus. No, he starts off with, Jesus, we love you so much. And we pray for your wisdom, for your power of peace. For, and he starts going through this prayer. I'm like, Rightly for your named joy. Solomon. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. And, and going, for your peace and your joy to fill our hearts. He's five. Wow. And my heart is gripped by his prayer. You got to keep that going, bro. Yeah. So j- working with him and not pushing it. If they're like, I don't want to do it, Dad. I'm like, okay, we won't do it today. <laughs> and my wife working with me going, would you rather them do it or would you rather keep connection? I'm like, Okay. Kind of funny, you know, we were always wanting our kids to engage with the scripture too. Mm. And uh, so when they became teenagers, you know, what we asked them to do is read one chapter of Proverbs a day. Oh, wow. That's so, cool. Well, yeah, it didn't really work, but it, I mean, <laughs> that was the goal, right? Yeah. I'll so, ask Jay. Yes. He'll, he'll, he'll tell you. So I would say, they'd go, hey, can I go such, such, say, what, how, did, did you read one proverb a day t- this week? And they're like, no, I'm a little behind. How many are you behind? Uh, like 14. You know? <laughs> I haven't actually done it in two Honesty weeks. Honesty is a core value in <laughs> <So>, your family. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, dude, you got to get your Proverbs caught up before you Whoa, can go. That's yeah. cool. And who knows how that went, you know? Well, that's amazing, though. But the goal, you know, the goal was for them to, first of all, have a high value for the Bible. Yeah. Proverbs is, is such a great book for oh teenagers, man, because... It talks about, you know, sexuality, yep. lust, mm-hmm. ambition, money, mm-hmm. friends, fools, wise people. You know, it's yeah. just like, you, you know, and then they were reading out of the Message Bible. Yeah. So in so those cool. days. Yeah. So that that's really cool. Mm-hmm. What's the greatest challenge you have right now in your life with related to the Lord? And do you, I mean, just what's the greatest challenge you have? Um, right now. I think there's, I mean, I and, and what are you three. doing? And what are you doing to help it? I could probably name like three of them. Yeah. Of the grab one. Yeah. Grab one. The first one that comes to my mind is honestly, um, the journey of not wearing armor. Like, tell me about that. So I think leaders through pain, through hurt, through experiences, um, and even through others can feel a pressure to self protect. And, um, you have this, you know, reading David's journey is such a wild ride. Uh-huh. You, but you see this moment where they th- see David going into battle and their assumption is he needs armor. Yeah. Their assumption is... With Goliath. Yeah, they're like, you need to put on this armor. And armor does great things. But for David, it wasn't what he needed in that fight. Yeah. And so I think sometimes my, my journey right now is to go, am I being armored? Am I coming up? Not like, am I putting on the armor of God? Mm-hmm. Am I... Actually coming in more guarded, suspicious, more l- lack of trusting of another person, trying to protect mine, trying to protect me. Try- and so I'm regularly engaging going, am I afraid of the outcome if I'm truly myself? Am I afraid of the outcome if I am vulnerable with the people around me, if I tell them what's really going on? And I've loved some of the, even the way that you lead with your mm-hmm. vulnerability, even with our senior leadership team, yeah. the way that you lead with your vulnerability. We're fighting to come in and go, hey, the armor stays at the door. Your battle stuff that you wear to, to take the ground that God has asked you to take stays at the door. Come in unguarded let's let's be open with each other you know there's the bill there's a beautiful illustration i think it's in um it's in first samuel 19 i believe 
but it's where Jonathan and David make a covenant. Mm. And the beautiful illustration of what you just said yeah. is he literally takes off his robe. Wow. He literally takes off his armor and his bow and his and his shield mm. and his sword, and he hands it to David. Wow. Which is the and and then and the Bible calls that it says the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And what I'm getting at is wow. it's the most beautiful illustration of what you just said. Mm. Because he literally took off his off. armor. Wow. And then he didn't just take it off, he gave it to David. Yeah. And he gave his weapons to David. In other words, I'm fully vulnerable. And not only, not only have I taken off my 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 armor, but I actually gave you yeah. my weapons. And I, I think wow. it's a you know, it, Jonathan and David was uh, a great. I, mean, um, I think that oftentimes people in the military bond through the the pain and the mm. challenge of, of war. Yeah. But I think it's also beautiful to think through friendships and especially yeah. with our with our wives or husbands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I take off my armor, but not yes. only that, but vulnerability. You know, uh, I love the way Danny said. Uh, he, I think he's the one who coined a phrase. Intimacy, intimacy is into me your seat. Yeah, and um, and I think that um, when we think of betrayal, mm-hmm. betrayal is not uh, you. You said something that hurt me. Yeah, betrayal yeah. is when you take the secrets that mm. only you know. Yep, that only you know. Yeah, and you use them against me. Yep. Yep. And right. this is this is the stuff where that makes the difference of the leaders who grow deep in the hidden place, who grow deep where no one is watching versus all the things that they do. It's like uh, there's a a picture of a bamboo tree. A bamboo tree will grow underground for years. So if you measure a gra- a bamboo tree's growth compared to the growth of other trees, it'll look like a failure. Yes. But then it will shoot in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Higher than any other tree in the yeah. area and be more durable than any other tree in the area. Yeah. And but it's the idea of the hidden life, the life that nobody can know about, the decisions only you and God the know roots, about. The, the roots. roots. Yeah. Exactly. Going deep, which is why I love Jonathan's journey, David and Saul's journey, because Saul has this moment where the prophet doesn't show up in the time frame he wanted, and you see his franticness because it said the people started to leave him. Yeah. And he starts to feel frantic. He gets scared. He gets scared. And then he does a decision that only he knows the decision is wrong. Like, he, this is the wrong decision. Yeah, because you look at it from the Bible, it doesn't look like a big deal. Yep. But then he lost his kingship over it, right? And that's the exact moment. God, but the phrase God says after that is, I'm looking for someone after my heart, not who's a qualified leader. He's not going, who's the most skilled leader in the area? He goes, I'm looking for someone after my heart. And a leader after, or a person after God's heart, anybody after God's heart, is going to care whether you're living guarded or not in your own heart, you're going, am I open to God? Am I open to people? Am I open with myself? It's so good. You know, you can only be loved to the level you can be hurt. Mm. And I think the challenge is, is that once you've been hurt, yeah, it's once true. especially betrayed, like you let somebody deep in, you mm-hmm. let somebody in really deep, a friend, yeah, a spouse, a mm. lover, you know, a, a shepherd, a pastor. Yeah. And then they... They did something. They used the, their intimacy, their into me, mm. you see, and they used it to hurt me. Mm-hmm. Maybe not even on purpose, but, yeah. but it happened, right? Then from then on, I start to build a castle. Of, mm-hmm. I call it an ice castle. Yeah. And I'm in that ice castle, and I'm starving for mm. love, but I am terrified of hurt. Yeah. And love. the only way, I, only way I, I get loved is to make a conscious effort Mm-hmm. Step out of the walls of the ice castle again, mm-hmm. because I can't be loved unless I can be hurt. Wow! And so, so good. this is so beautiful. Chris, you wrote a book. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I don't have the title here. The practice of being with Jesus. The practice of being with Jesus. And mm-hmm. how can they get that book? You can get it on Amazon. Yep. Get it on yeah. Amazon. And I think Bethel's bookstore as well, and on our online store we have it. But Amazon.com is the easiest. Do you yeah. have your own website? Uh, I do. Yeah, the practice of being with Jesus.com. It's going to send you right to Amazon as well, so it works out both ways. Great. So, Great. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you very very much for being yeah. on. Yeah, so much fun being with Why you. Why don't you just uh, uh, a quick prayer for people yeah. in this whole area of discipleship yeah. and the scriptures? Yeah, Father, I ask that those who long to know you would find you. That yeah. year, that they would, their hearts ache would lead them to the place where you are, which is with them. They would discover 
that you are right there. In those moments, they would find themselves caught up in the reality that you have never left their side and that you would, they would be lost in this and they would be settled in this and they would be content in this, lost in the right ways. They would find themselves completely enraptured with you. And from that place of contentment and settledness, they would learn from you. You would yes. teach them. You would search their heart. And then from that, they'd be transformed from the inside out. Mm-hmm. It's the image and likeness of your son, Jesus. Thank you. I ask you to do this by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. Please check out our social pages. We put some new stuff on there all, all week long and also our YouTube channel. God bless you. See you again next week.